As I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for forgiving you for His name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known Him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known Him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Let's go to one prayer. Most gracious, kind of Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you, Lord, and we just pray right now, Father, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, use this time in our lives, Father. I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to <coughs> stop for just a few moments. God, and to recognize exactly where we're at. Lord, show us what we need revealed to us in this, in this moment of time so that we, Lord, may line our lives up with what you want to do and be used for your greater glory. God, I pray if there's one lost here today that they be saved and that those who are saved would grow deeper because of this, this moment in time today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, as we continue to study 1 John, this is a, 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 a part of Scripture as you read 1 John where it's almost a momentary pause because we've talked about how that this has been written for our joy to be full. It's been written, uh, if you look at the end of the text, that it's for uh, us to know that we're safe. So, uh, you know, John really, from, from the beginning of 1 John to the end of 1 John, God is having John to to give us ways to examine our salvation, to really put ourselves under the microscope. And here he, he stops and, and he's not just saying, you know, okay, look at your salvation. He's saying, okay, let's, let's go with the fact that, that many of us are saved. Many of us do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he begins to look at the spiritual maturity of believers. The spiritual maturity. See, Everything really to this point has just been that hard self-examination. Look at you, look at you, look at you. All about salvation. Uh, are you walking righteously or are you simply professing to know Jesus? Are you confessing known sin in your life? Because that's what a child of God will do. They will confess known sin to God because through that comes the forgiveness of that sin. Are you striving to obey the Word of God? Is it your genuine desire to do what God's Word says? And do you love those that love Him? We talked about that last week. Is there a genuine love for those who profess to know Jesus? And we could, considering all this, we could, we could look at a statement made by Jesus Christ up to this point that would, that would help us in our reflection of what John has already told us in Matthew 7, 20. It says, Whereby their fruits ye shall know them. At the end of the day, the proof, the actions of your life, of my life, far outshine anything we say. Right. <clears throat> I can stand up here and if God were to give me the best sermon in the world, but yet I don't attempt to flesh that out the rest of my life, the rest of my time. What I've said really doesn't matter, does it? Right. <clears throat> we say talk, ask to match the walk and things like that. But the evidence flowing from my life is what John is begging us to consider. What is flowing from your life, that is what John is saying. You need to consider not only what you think you have, but what you actually are demonstrating that you have. See, we need to look at everything, the entire body of work. Be willing to admit where you are. See, the thing that we just said that Jesus said in Matthew 7 20 about by their fruits you shall know them can also be applied to what we're looking at today as far as spiritual maturity is concerned. Because listen, the evidence coming out of us speaks volumes as to where we are on our journey with Christ. That's right. It's supposed to be a continual growth process. It's supposed to be, guess what? You were dead, now you're alive. And it's just not that I was dead and now I'm alive. Listen, the Bible describes those who have just come to know Jesus. 
Jesus Christ as babies, that they are just as if ones that have been brought into this world physically. Listen, you have been spiritually born. Jesus told uh, Nicodemus when he came to him by night, he said, you must be born again. Yeah. You've got to begin this life spiritually. You've, done, you've started physically, but you must begin physically. I mean, you must begin spiritually. You've done it physically. Now, you must do it spiritually. So, well, what's the point, Brother Jeff? Well, listen, you're not meant to be a baby for the rest of your spiritual life. While you're alive on this earth, you're not meant to continue in that same behavior in that same attitude in that same mentality even as you were when you first got saved it is a continual growth process and the thing that john is begging people to evaluate in light of spiritual maturity is is listen you may say you may think well i, I, I pray for a lot of my christian walk but if we evaluate what we say about our walk and we really scrutinize our walk by the word of god i'm going to tell you something for 99 of us, we would come up with a different answer. We're not as mature as we think we are sometimes. We still look at things through a very baby, spiritual baby type lens. We still even look at things as a dead man looks at things at times. You follow me? John in our text defines three different types of people or three groups of people inside the body of Christ. And they represent the different stages that we enter into in our spiritual maturity. They're children, young men, and fathers. Did you notice that as we read this morning? <coughs> children, young men, and fathers. So the letter is to those, guess what, who are in the faith, and to those who are growing in the faith, and those who are mature in the faith. He's saying, I'm writing these things to you. Now notice, notice verse 12. He says, I'm writing you little children because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. We could say, and a lot of people look at this and they say, well, that's all believers, little children, children, children. If you are saved, you are a child of God, no doubt. But I, I am also a child of Eddie and Gail Cripps. But I'm no toddler. I'm no infant. I'm a grown man. Right? right. So as a, as a spiritual being, you who are saved are, are not supposed to remain infants and toddlers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship's supposed to become deeper and more meaningful as we go along in our life. Amen, brother. So this letter, he says first, is to those who are still young babies in the faith. There are those, listen, whose experience is with finding forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. Notice that. Your sins are forgiven you for His namesake. See, if you notice, John says your sins for His namesake, meaning because of Christ. Hey, listen, without Christ, true forgiveness, redemption, the removal of sin, once and for all, without Christ, that is not possible in any person's life. Amen. The only reason that you are saved, the only reason that you have forgiveness of sin is not because God looked down here and saw how good you were. I don't tell you what, God doesn't just, just save you so that you can say, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Listen, He saves folks for the glory of His Son. Jesus prayed, glorify me again with the same glory that I had. But from the beginning, listen, Jesus was saying, listen, Father, get yourself glory, but get it through what you're about to do, this redemptive work that's going to occur at the cross. Get the glory back. only reason you and I are saved is because God is good. Amen. And God is not willing that any should perish. He didn't look down here and see a good neighbor. He didn't look down here and see a good father, a good mother, a good son, or a good daughter and decide to save you. The only reason that you and I are saved is because Jesus paid it all. Amen. You know, that's a, it's a song, but it's the truth. Jesus paid it all, all to him all. Sin had left, left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 
I am forgiven. I am free. We've been singing about this morning only because of Jesus, not because of Jeff. And you can insert your name there. You're not anything in Christ because of you. Amen. If you're anything because of anything in Christ, it's all because of Jesus. Jesus suffered. Jesus died. Romans 5, 6 through 8 brings clarity to what I just said. It says, For when you were yet without strength, you were able. I wasn't able. In due time, Christ died for the who? For the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, son, would even dare to die. But listen, but God, but God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died while you were still sinning. He died when he knew that you would be what you are and what you've done. Yet he went to the cross and gave himself so that you and I, hey, listen, who would repent? Who would say, yes, Jesus, save me, so that we could have eternal life? Amen. It is because of Jesus. It is all because of Jesus. So then we understand also why God tells John to give us this second statement that he says regarding little children. In verse 13, he says, I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. And what did we sit there and sing a minute ago? He's a good, good Father. Amen. He's a good, good Father. Why is He good that? Why is he good to you this morning? What, what, what reason? If we went around this room right now, why would you say he's good? Listen, little children, those who are new to the faith know he's good because they have experienced the forgiveness of sin. They have got to the place where they realize that apart from Christ, they're bound for a sinner's hell. Apart from Christ, there was no hope. They tried to change their ways. They tried to live right. And when they finally realized that they could not do it, that it had to be only what God could do. Listen, God had already come through. God had already paid the price. He is a good, good father. You know, John said that there was a time you didn't know. You didn't know God. You didn't even have a relationship with God. You were separated from God. The Bible describes us as aliens, not from outer space, folks, that we were foreigners, that we were not a part of Him, that we were completely without a relationship to Him. Amen. Strangers wandering through this world. We were living our own way, doing our own thing, thinking it was all going to work out great. But then God. Hey, I had it all figured out, folks. Go to church. Try to live right, sing, do what they tell you to do, and it'll all be fine. But then God, then God convicted my heart. Then God said, you think you've got this figured out? You think you think that you'll just keep living and you'll just keep doing? And then one day you'll stand before me and I'll say, come on in. And the truth of the matter is, Jeff, if you don't give your heart to me, you'll die and go to hell. Amen. See, it's but then God. Yeah. Not but then Jeff, but not, not that then Jeff said, oh, I don't think this line of thinking is going to work out. I'm, I'm not sure this is all going to pan out the way it should. God shook me. God said, you will not be able to enter in if you go the way you're going. He got a hold to my heart, and I had to decide whether he was right or whether I was going to try to be right. Amen. <clears throat> That's everybody's story who's a child of God, but then God. God convicted you of your sin. You said yes to Him. You, you recognize that Jesus didn't come just as a cute story for us to tell our children, but that He came so that you might have life. And then we realize the truth of several of Paul's writing where he says we've been adopted into the Spirit inside of us. Christ, Father, I have a Father, I have a Father, which is to say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Amen. And when you come to know Christ, you come to know the truth of 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, when it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. Listen, what manner of love He hath bestowed, what manner of love He has showered upon us that we should even be called, what? The sons of God. I don't deserve to be 
they call a son of God. Listen, if I deserve anything, I deserve hell. But listen, even if you go into heaven, folks, I don't deserve to be called a son. Maybe a, maybe a slave, maybe a servant. But he says, guess what? You've trusted my son who paid the ultimate price. And so I call you not a servant. I call you a son. Amen. I call you a son. You are different now. You are different from this world. You used to fit in. Now you stand out. You are one that is the proverbial square peg in a round hole. But listen. Here's why I believe God gave John this word to little children this morning. Why he gave this word to save young men. And then he comes to the point of saying you father. Because at some point, we have got to stop basking in the glory of I am redeemed. And we have to destroy our contentment with being able to just get through the gate. And we've got to grow up. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, it's great. I love to say it. I'm not talking about the song. If y'all get mixed up here. Don't get mixed up. I'm not talking about the song we sing, I Am Redeemed. I'm not talking about that old hymn we used to sing, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, whose child and forever I am. Listen, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we, 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 got, to, we got to not get over getting saved, but we got to move forward from getting saved. Because God's will for your life and my life is not just for us to be in the boat. It's for us to be actively working to lead others to Him, to see others grow in Him. Listen, God has more for you to do than to walk around going, I got it. I got it. I'm saved. I'm saved. Oh, Jesus got to love to me one day. I'm saved. Grow up. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the fact that you were dead and now you're alive? What are you going to do about the fact that now you are saved and now you know the truth? we got to move from being a baby to being a child and then, which is a young believer. So from a child to a young man or a young believer, and then Paul, Paul said this. God gave Paul this word. It applies physically, but it also applies spiritually. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, get this. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Do you follow me this morning? I told you, there's folks who still are doing things that are very childlike as far as Christianity is concerned. And you know what? I have to remember that. I have to remember that some folks are not as far along on this journey. And you, listen, you who are spiritual, the Bible commands us that we who are spiritual are supposed to look after those folks. It's part of the problem. Here's what the church does. Can you believe they're acting like that? Can you believe they're talking like that? Can you believe they're doing the things they're doing? Hey! Some of them aren't saved and some of them are just barely over the line of death. Man, yeah. Never grown. Never gotten any more spiritual food. Oh, they come and they sit through the church service, but they're not allowing God to change them and shape them. Amen, brother. That's right, brother Jeff. That's the Bible. God's not for God's desire for your life is not to make you comfortable sitting in your seat. I hope you get a burr in your saddle before you leave here this morning. Time in the faith. Listen, time in the faith. Sometimes Christians can look at things from a very immature perspective. But their time in the faith, and I'm not talking about uh, physical age. I'm not even talking about how long you've been saved. Some people want to tell you how long they've been saved. But then you can observe behavior that says, hey, you've never grown. You've never gotten any further along. Time in the faith does not equate to spiritual maturity. Yeah. It's not how God says it works. I'm sorry. I've been saved for 40 years. So what? 
So what? Well, Brother Jeff, why would you say that? Because the reason that some folks still speak, think, and even act the way they do is they have never made growing in Christ their aim. They get in, they are saved, they are there, they're going home to be with Jesus when they die. But look how John addresses this next group. And it helps you understand why that can happen to someone. Why someone who is saved, that's it. That's it. Look what he said to this next group of people. In verses 13 and 14, he, he noted that I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Then in verse 14, what he notes is, he says uh, right here, because you are strong. Young men, I've written to you because you're strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. What? What are you talking about? See, the two, th the two things that he says to the young men there uh, in the faith, or the young people in the faith. We're not talking about teenagers. We're talking about folks who have progressed from spiritual babies. Now they're spiritual young children. Okay? They're growing. They're not to adulthood. They're not to the age where they could father a child or have a child in the faith. They are only spiritual children. And the two things he says to those who are young in the faith are not independent of each other without a strong foundation. In this right here. Without a strong foundation in this right here, I want you to understand something. You will never overcome the devil. You will never withstand the enemy. You will never be able to handle the onslaughts that he will deal out. And listen, folks, here's the problem with that. You say, well, Brother Jeff, I'm the devil, he's just constantly after me. Welcome to the club. about because, I mean, he's after me all the time. Hello? Hello? Do you know who the devil is? A defeated foe. Amen. You, are you are warring against a being whose back was broken at the cross of Calvary. You are choosing to allow someone to torment you that the, the Bible is finished. The, the, the end has been written. This is not some fairy tale story book that just turned out good. This is the truth from the God of heaven. And he said in the end, he will lock the enemy in the pit of hell. And he'll be there forever and ever and ever. That's all we got. Give him glory.
See, the devil wants to do all he can to wreak havoc on you, to discourage you, to diminish your faith, to destroy your witness. But I read that Jesus said, all power is given unto him in heaven and on earth. And listen, if you are saying today, that same power is in you, and you need to, not by the authority of Jeff, not by the authority of insert your name there, but by the authority of Jesus Christ, you need to withstand all the horrors of hell, the devil himself, and rebuke him in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You tell him to get off you, to get away from you, and back to hell because he has no place and no authority over you. Brother Jeff, where do you find that at the Bible? James chapter 4, verse 7. What does it say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He cannot stand up to a child of God who has the faith of God, who has the word of God. Him. He cannot. He cannot. <coughs> How do you know that, Brother Jeff? Y'all just sit there. I'm, 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 I'm written. written, brother. You might be sitting here this morning going, oh, I'm just not there, Brother Jeff. I've just not gotten to that place. Well, let me tell you what you need to do. Dig in the Word. What did he say to the young man? You have done what? You have overcome the wicked one. Well, why have you been able to overcome the wicked one? Because you are strong and the Word of God abideth in you. The Word of God is in you. What are you saying? What are you saying, Brother Jeff? <laughs> Listen. God told Peter to pen it. 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow there by. You'll never grow without it, folks. You will never be able to combat lies with truth until you dig in. You will never be able to overcome disappointment with hope. You will never be able to go against sin with the solution until you devour the Word of God in your heart and life. What do you mean, Brother Jeff? Well, listen, I'll just use the sin one for a second. In these pages are not just a word on what to do when you mess up. Oh, it says what to do when you mess up. We confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But in the pages of this Word is not just what to do when you mess up, but strength to stand, even prevent things from happening, to keep from messing up before it gets going that direction. People wonder, why is there greater joy when they begin to study the Word? Why is it when I begin to reach out? Why is it when I begin to do those things that the Bible has commanded? When I, I, I'm in touch with the Word of God and the will of God, why is it? Because those folks have got to the place where they realize they are not awaiting victory. They are victorious. Amen. Why are they victorious? Because of what God has done in Christ. See, that's what the Word can do. It is there for our benefit, for our learning. And then, then we see a final group. So we, we've got people who have, who have realized that the battles. Not with the devil, that's done. That you know, he's going to try to scheme and scam and trip us up, and he's going to be ready because we have devoured the word of God. Now, now, now what? Now what? He says, You fathers. And he's saying this to people who have reached spiritual maturity. Does it mean that they have nothing left to learn? <clears throat> Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Christianity, listen, you get saved, that means, guess what? What happens to you? You're justified. You are living throughout the rest of this physical life. You're being sanctified. You are being constantly worked on 
being worked on to conform to that image of the Son. You are being worked on to be that very representation of Christ on this earth. So, so there's going to be some times we're going to slip up, mess up, trip up, but we're coming back. We're coming back stronger. We're not. That's not going to happen. You do You got me there, but you won't get me next time. Are you with me? Amen. We're being sanctified. Set apart for the Master Jesus. And then one day we will be glorified. We will be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye. I will shed this old fleshly, evil body. Amen. And I will instead exchange it for a glorified body that will know no sin, commit no sin, live no longer in sin. But that's not supposed to stop me from maturing in my faith just because I have an old man that I wrestle with. And so he says to them in verses 13 and 14, he says it twice, but he says, I write unto you, verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And in verse 14, what does he say? I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. He has said that statement twice. What does that say to us this morning? They, these are the people who really know God. They don't know God by proxy. They don't know God by somebody else's testimony. They know God because they have walked with God. Day in, day out. They've been there. They've done that. They've walked with God. And because they've walked with God, they know God. And they know Him not just because of saving faith. They know Him because of living faith. See, these are those who at any age, <clears throat> at any age, at any time, at any time, they have matured to the place where they realize the faithfulness of God and they are not now just seeking to bring others to faith, but they are seeking that the children, that the babies might mature in their faith. That they might grow up and to full maturity and that they might be used of God and that they might know God in a real and personal way whereby they walk with Him consistently day by day, moment by moment. They know Him not just by the saving faith, but by the living faith. How do you really know Him? Walking with Him daily through the constant communion, through uh, being with the Father, not, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. See, statements, statements of truth flow out of the reservoir of experience from those who are fully mature. And they flow from those who are fully mature to those who are still not yet mature. Statements like this one, Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he hath, which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, if Jesus has saved you, it will not change. He will not go back on his word. He is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. Here's what happens, folks. Some spiritual babies, they get started and they want to go well and they want to do well, and then something happens. And they trip, stumble, fall. And they need, they need someone mature in the faith to come alongside them and say, God didn't quit when you get up. Just because you messed up, listen, there's forgiveness of sin. Come on. Come on. Back to it. God's going to finish what He started. He, he, he didn't save you to, to, to shipwreck you. He didn't save you to go back on His promise. He didn't save you. Come on. Get back up. Get back up. Our statements like these. Words of encouragement for those who are struggling. Statements like these found in, 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 from the lips of David in Psalms 37, 25. He says, I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor received any bread. I've never seen God give up on his children. I've never seen God let people keep going and going and struggle and struggle and not come through for them. Amen. Well, I've seen them hurt. I've seen some pain. But I've never seen my God give up on anybody. See, the heart of a father of faith is to impart the wisdom that they have learned throughout their walk. Their walk that went through the mountains. But really the lessons learned in the valley. 
See, we have in Scripture one of the greatest examples of a father in the faith. You want to see how a father operates toward a, someone who's not yet mature in the faith? You read the letters of Paul to Timothy. With the first letter that we have recorded to Timothy here, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 2, look what Paul says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Our hope. Our only hope. Unto Timothy. Who? Who's Timothy? My own son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. Hey, Timothy. God told me to write to you. Hey, Timothy. There's some things I need to help you understand that I want to teach you. There's some wisdom that I've gathered along my journey that I want to tell you about. That's how Paul, that's how Paul begins this letter to Timothy. By the second letter, listen, Paul is closer to heaven than he is this earth. What do you mean? He's still alive? Yeah. But he's so far along on his journey that he looks back over everything that happened. Adam quoted it last week in his sermon. We went to that passage. And he says, "When well, I thought of this. I kept the faith. He, I'm ready to be offered up. I'm ready. The time of my departure is at hand. That's, that's what Paul was telling Timothy in the second letter. And that was, that was a, a note to Timothy that my work is about doing it. But Timothy, look what a responsibility you have. Look what you have coming behind you. See, both letters are trying to teach Timothy, to grow Timothy, so that he can stand day by day with the same confidence that marked Paul's life. You know what you got from the Jew? Yes, all I got. But here's the question. Where are you at? Where are you at? If you're honest this morning, where are you at? Are you still a child being tossed about to and fro because you're not digging into the Word and the enemy's attacking and, 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 and you just really never settled the fact that devil, you're defeated. You have no power. You have no place. No way, no how. Hello? Are you, are you, are you in that Young child, young men, not, not yet able to have children in the faith. But are you at that place where, yeah, I got this. I, I realize that through Christ I'm able to stand. That I, I'm able with the armor of God, with the word of God, with all the things that have been given to me in Christ Jesus. That the, the enemy has no power. He cannot do anything to me. He cannot touch me. Hey, listen, I am strong in the word. Are you to wear that place where God be asking you? When are you? When are you going to reach down to those who are not mature and say, let me help you. Let me show you something. Let me walk with you. Let me teach you. Listen, it takes, it takes people maturing in their faith to bring others along in their faith. Because then... We begin to operate in our faith. And guess what happens? The cycle continues of people coming to faith, growing in the faith, maturing in the faith. It goes on, it goes on, and it goes on. Don't let salvation be enough, folks. Don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied. <coughs> let God have His perfect work. It'll be for your good. It'll be for His glory. Amen.